Hello, good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm trying to just uh, go live on the Facebook Live again. Okay, so it seems that uh, just now we have you know, the, done the Facebook Live and uh, the thing is that when something happened, okay, we encountered some technical problems. Okay, so now I restarted it. I restarted and uh, ho hopefully it is going to be fine. Again, I also do the, the you know the video video recording okay on another device on my the, you know the iPhone so even though the Facebook live encounters a the problems okay the, you will not be prevented from viewing my lecture later on YouTube okay because I'm good I now recording my the lecture as well and at the end of my lecture I'm going to make it available on YouTube okay you should see it in the uh, uh, latest uh, in the middle of the night okay uh, just now we have talked about the cisc okay because of the technical problems i need to just uh, you know the i need to just read i need to just repeat my lecture a bit okay so the, let me now uh, go to my desk okay in order to uh, just continue my lecture okay so the hello uh, good evening okay can you hear me well right so the uh, let me just start my the lecture just now. We talk about the CISG. Remember last week? Uh, last week we uh, discussed okay the scope of application of the CISG. You have seen already that CISG applies to what kind of sale contracts, and you have also seen the, uh, some transactions which are placed outside the application of the CISG. Okay. So this evening we will talk about you know the the matters other matters okay which fall within the ambit of the application of the CHG. If you look at this screen again, you will see that you know the what it what falls within the scope of application of the CIHG uh, are fol uh, are the, the following. The first one is you know the the formation of contract. The second one is the obligations okay of the parties obligations of the seller and obligations of the buyer and uh, we will uh, also the, you know to talk about the passing of risk which is also the matter following okay within the CAG as well okay and uh, we will also talk about breach and remedies if time permits we will proceed to our description of exemption of liability okay in some situations the party will be exempt from liability okay that, that is the provision on the force measure okay but i'm not quite sure whether terms will permit us to cover all of this but i will try okay to cover all those matters okay uh perhaps let me just look at uh our facebook live right now okay i will just look at you know the our cross coding the window via uh, yes a mobile phone again okay. i use three devices the first one is tablet which is being used for you know the for the facebook live recording okay the other one it is used for recording my lecture which is going to be uploaded on uh, youtube okay the at the end of my lecture okay uh, hopefully at, in the middle of uh, tonight okay we will see also the video files on on the YouTube as, as well, okay. Uh, and this device is used for looking at okay my own movement, okay, on the you know the on on every online classroom. If you have uh, any the problems, okay, that you can also let me uh, see, okay. The, sorry, let, let me see the you, okay, your messages when the uh, which which are sent. Uh, to have the online classroom okay i can just see it through this uh, mobile phone okay so the uh according to your message Minda, some of you tell me that you can hear me uh very very clearly okay that is a good thing but i'm not quite sure okay whether the uh, video signal seems to be fine but i see something quite blurry okay the, on the, the mobile phone here okay but i hope that you are okay with that uh your voice is very clear okay according to one of you here okay thank you for your message now let me just proceed to my lecture okay what we will talk about tonight okay it is the formation of contract 
of course, when the, we will look at how a contract of uh, international sales is formed. Okay, so when we talk about the formation contract, the, the principle which is embodied in the CAG, it is not different from you know the principles of law which you have seen in the laws of other countries. Okay, so a contract is formed by the meeting of the minds. Okay, or if you prefer the Latin expression, we we have a Latin expression. Okay, consensus and item. Okay, the, the meeting of the minds. That means that one person must make an offer and the other one must make an acceptance. So two minds must meet, uh, A's mind and B's mind. If we have A and B, you know, the uh, making a contract. Okay, so a contract is formed by the meeting between A's mind and B's mind. In the sense that A makes an offer and B makes an acceptance of A's offer. Okay, so when an offer and acceptance meet, a contract is formed. When I say that you know a contract is formed by the meeting between an offer and acceptance, you need to be mindful that you know an acceptance must must uh, match an offer completely. Okay, that means that there must not be any difference, any there must not be any discrepancy between an offer and acceptance. Okay, an acceptance must be must be the matching and offer that in all respects if there is any difference okay then that is not you know that that is not the t uh, something which turns that, that is turned into the contract okay when an acceptance meets an offer completely we call to that acceptance as an unqualified acceptance okay that is an acceptance which does not differ from an offer in any way okay if an acceptance you know that differs from an offer then that is not an acceptance okay that is a counter offer we will talk about, about that later okay but one thing which you should be mindful is this in order for a contract to be formed before a contract is formed before a contract is finally formed a and b may enter into perhaps okay some negotiations Okay, so we might have some negotiations, sometimes many rounds of negotiation between A and B. And uh, a long series of negotiations may occur before A and B, you know, to finally conclude a contract. Okay, in the process of negotiations, okay, you may wonder whether or not okay, any party can be liable to the other. Okay, that depends on, you know, the law of each jurisdiction. Okay. In some jurisdictions, the law seem to uh, seem to be you know founded upon the idea that in the process of negotiations, okay, before a contract is formed, no party will be liable to the other party in any way. Okay, so there is no uh, such thing as free contractual liability. Okay, so because the party has freedom, the freedom of contract, the party has the party enjoys the party autonomy. That means that they can just they can be free to enter into a contract or not to enter into a contract. Okay, it's up to them to enter or not to enter into a contract. Okay, let's say that I mean the A and B they have embarked on you know the a long series of negotiation and on a good day A chooses not to enter into a contract with B, then in that case I mean the, in many countries the law maintain the position that A will not be liable to B in any way. Okay, that A will not be liable to B, okay, for not entering into a contract later, even though they, you know, have uh, started or they have, you know, the, they have embarked on a long series of negotiations. But in some countries, the law seems to have some principles under which a party in the process of negotiation may be liable to the other okay the uh, so the, for instance in the english law okay there are uh, some the piecemeal principles which by which okay a, a party let's say a uh, will be liable to b if a gives some statements to b in order uh, in order to induce b to enter into a contract okay so the uh, but we, we, we are not going to, you know, the, to just I mean, give a lecture on the English contract law to be the same thing. Okay? But 
for your information. English law has, you know, some uh, doctrines whereby a party may be liable to the other in the process of negotiation, okay? Uh, for instance, in the, the, the doctrine which is known as uh, the collateral, collateral contract doctrine, okay? That according to that doctrine, uh, you know, if A gives some statement to B in order to induce B to enter into contract, then the statement given by A may also be liable. Uh, sorry, may or the, the statement given by A may also, you know, be binding uh, upon the A. Uh, you know, the A might also be liable, even uh, not uh, in contract, but A will be liable to be in a uh, collateral contract. Okay, so, the, so some countries may have some principles whereby, you know, the, even in the process of negotiation, okay, uh, they can also be liable in some way. Right, so the, the liability which arises, you know, the, before a contract is formed like this, it is called the pre-contractual liabilities, or the, if you prefer the Latin term, okay, it is culpa in contrahendo. Okay, so the, we're not going to discuss this in the, this evening, okay, so normally those who are interested in this matters are students in the private law, okay, not students in the international trade law. Uh, the video is uh, blurry and I cannot hear you. There is a, uh, there is, I mean, the uh, in interrupting noise like what happened uh, uh, last week. Uh, I, I can't explain this one, okay, so uh, don't worry, I mean, the, uh, I think that with the uh, uh, Facebook Live, these savings doesn't seem to work. So the, I think that means I can just stop, you know, the... Facebook Live, so that I means I can just resort to you know the, my uh, video recording, so that I'm going to just upload this file on the you know YouTube at the end of my lecture. Now let me just I mean, go to have a check on the the screen the, uh, when I am videoing this file. It seems to be fine. My video seems to be fine at the moment. Okay, so the, I just now you know finish. The, the you know the the, the live uh, broadcasting okay on Facebook okay and result just to my uh, lecture my uh, you know the recorded lecture okay I'm now rec recording my lecture and uh, all you here my students you can just okay to watch my the lecture okay on YouTube at the end of my lecture when I you know upload them the you know the Maybe maybe I upload just one single file, okay, so, oh, two at least, okay, because we will have a break. So, the, we will have two files, the file which contains my lecture before the break and the file which contains my lecture after the break, okay, so, fine. Uh, if it is possible, I can just combine these two files into a single file, or alternatively, I can just I mean, split, it, split, it, split them into two files and make them make them available on, the, you know, do two, okay, don't worry, okay. Uh, even though you encounter some problems, okay, the, uh, in the Facebook Live, but I mean, it doesn't matter because you can still watch my uh, video, okay, later. Now let me go back to the desk, okay. So the, we are now talking about, talking about the formation of a contract, right? A contract is formed by the meeting of the mice, right? The one person must make an offer and the other one must make an acceptance. Okay. Uh, for one thing, the CISG uh, does not want a contract to be subject to any formal requirements. Right. Uh, so the principle that the principle which holds that a contract can be formed without any formal requirement, it is known as the freedom from form principle. Okay. Uh, so the reason behind it behind this principle is that. A contract should be allowed to be formed uh, easily, okay, without any you know restriction on the on on what on the without any formal restriction without any the you know the uh, requirement as to as to writing as to written evidence as to signature, right? The requirement as to writing written evidence or signature or the like it it is known as a formal requirement. So a contract should be allowed to be made without uh, any of these requirements. 
Right, so the, the freedom from form principle seems to be adopted in many countries, even in uh, uh, contracts in general, uh, even though they are not, you know, the uh, sales contracts, okay? So the, the freedom from form principle, it is not surprising at all, okay? In the, in the CISC, it is embodied in Article 11. If you look at Article 11, Okay, we the, we can see that this article provides as follows: a contract of sale need not be concluded in or evidenced by writing, and not and is not subject to any other requirement as to form. It may be proved, sorry, it may be proved by any means, including witnesses. See. So you don't need to make a contract in writing. You don't need to, uh, you know, the, have signatures on your contract. Okay, the, you can even, the, you know, make a contract even verbally. A contract, the contract formation can be proved even by witnesses. You can just call, uh, you know, persons uh, as your own witnesses. Okay, if you want to prove the formation of a contract before a, before, you know, a, a, a competent court, okay. So, if you look at the commentary, commentary to the CHG, you can see that the rationale behind the freedom from form rule is this. Okay, that it was felt at the time of you know, preparation of CHG that, right, when the people could just resort to you know, some the modern means of communication. Modern means, modern means of communication should allow parties to enter into contract conveniently. I'm sure that you know at the time when the CHG was drafted, at the time when CHG was finalized, at that time you mean there was no spread no widespread use of the internet. Probably there was no you know internet yet at at that at the time, okay? Uh, so the but even though that there was no internet uh, lies what we have now it could be foreseen you know that in the future there would be some technologies which allow you know parties which allow individuals to make contract very very conveniently so that if the law imposes on uh, you know parties a duty to oh, sorry the an obligation to make a contract okay in writing okay the, or, or if the law does mean uh, require that a uh, contract be subject to you know some form requirement like signature or the like, then it might con con constitute some impediment to you know the making of the contract. That's why you know CAG does chose you know the the, the the view that there should not be any restrictions. Okay, there should not be any requirements as to form so that a contract does not need to be in writing, the con a contract does not need to be evidenced by writing, a contract does not need to bear any signature. Okay. Of course, in most cases, a contract may be made you know, in the form of a document. Maybe the contract is made in writing, the contract is evidenced by writing, but it does not need to be so. A contract can be formed even verbally, Orally, okay, you can see that means in some cases, again, okay, uh, contracts could be formed even verbally, okay, and uh, in some cases, a contract can even be formed by conduct of the parties. The conduct concerned uh, leads to the understanding that A and B, the parties, they have made a contract, okay, so uh, we can see, you know. Uh, examples from you know decided cases I have I think I, I have made a mention that you know the uh, the Ancitro has established in fact you know the database containing you know ca uh, cases which have been brought before courts or tribunals in many countries uh, okay the, because I mean the see the CHG that promotes the uniformity so in order to promote uniformity the Ancitro does put in place a database containing the you know, cases which have been brought before courts or tribunals in many countries. So let's say that one day Thailand become a party to the CHG and uh, one case 
occurs in this uh, in our country, we can just check whether or not, you know, similar similar cases, the case uh, whether case is similar to the facts which we have right now. Okay, uh, can be found in some of the countries. Uh, if there are some cases, okay, of similar nature in the other countries, then the uh, the courts or tribunal in the Thailand may also, you know, the, try to just uh, look at, look at those cases in order to make sure that decisions which are going to be delivered by the court or you know the awards which are going to be uh, uh, given by the tribunal should not be so much different from decisions elsewhere, because if there are too many different decisions that is going to undermine the uniformity as contemplated by the CIHG, okay? So, on the database prepared by the CIHG, you will see many cases, okay? Uh, the, the, the database is called the C-L-O-U-T, Case Law on Ancestral, okay? If you go to websites, okay, you will see, you know, the C-L-O-U-T case, okay? So, the many, the C-L-O-U-T Cases, okay. One uh, of cases, okay, which you can find on the database, it is a case number one to one to three four. In the case one three four, this case gives, in fact, a very good reflection, okay, of the formation contract by conduct. In this case, when there there were two parties, of course, the seller and the buyer. The, the seller was from Finland. The buyer. Uh, was from Germany, okay? So the, it was concerned with a contract of sale of the nickel or copper cathodes. Okay, so the, uh, in, uh, in this case, the contract was signed only by the buyer, by the German buyer, but not by the Finnish seller. The contract uh, contained also, you know, an arbitration clause. Okay, the thing is that you know the, the contract was uh, made in the form of a document, but it was signed by only the buyer, not the seller in the Finland. It was signed only by the buyer in the Germany, not by the seller in Finland. Okay, so the, the thing is that when the, the buyer signed a contract, the seller, even the seller, did not sign this document, but the seller send the goods to the buyer the seller just deliver the goods to the buyer okay the goods uh, were, were means, uh, something like mean 17 million us dollars in this case okay after that the seller just you know assigned the right to claim the price to the plaintiff that's why the plaintiff sued you know the the german buyer here for payment of price right we have you know a question here uh, we have a question as to whether or not a contract of sale was formed okay and enforceable in this case okay even though it was here that even though okay it it was decided that even though you know, this contract was signed by the defendant i.e the buyer only without being signed by the seller either okay but there was a contract, there was an enforceable contract between the seller and the buyer, okay? Because the fact that the seller delivered the goods to the buyer, that that conduct, okay, could be understood as the assent to the contract, okay? The seller, as, the seller assented to the contract by conduct, i.e. by the delivery of the goods. So we can see from this case that okay, the contract could also be formed through delivery. Okay, just through the delivery. Right, so, the, so that okay, the, if we are back to the freedom from form principle, a contract can be formed by a document, a contract can be formed even verbally, and in some cases a contract can be formed even by conduct. And in this case, which we have seen just now, this contract was formed by conduct. The conduct here, okay, is the what? Is the delivery by the seller. Right, so we have a contract of sale. But this case was also concerned with the arbitration clause, okay, with respect to an arbitration clause. 
I think that the law the, on this point seems to be quite universal. Okay, the, in order for uh, a matter, in order for a dispute to go to arbitration, okay, there must be, you know, an arbitration agreement. And a bit, arbitration agreement must be in writing, okay, so that in this case it was here that, okay, the arbitration clause was not enforceable because when it was signed by the buyer only, it was not signed by the seller too, okay, so that uh, the arbitration agreement was not enforceable because of the lack of writing, right? Even though, even though, even though there was, even though there was the lack of written cons, the written consent with respect to you know the arbitration agreement, but in terms of the contract of sale, a contract of sale could be formed. We, we have. We have to split between a contract of sale and an arbitration clause in this case. And arbitration clause in this case was not enforceable because the seller did not sign, did not sign the agreement. But a contract of sale was okay. The contract of sale was enforceable. A contract was made and the contract was enforceable because the CISG did not require any formal requirements. The CISG did not require, you know, CISG does not require any writing. CISG does not require any, you know, the written evidence, nor any signature. Uh, so that this case seems to be a very good example, okay? But one thing which needs to be understood also is this, okay? Even though CISG focuses on the freedom from form principle. Some countries may have their own law, okay, requiring some for requiring some the forms. Right. I mean, uh, we can see that you know some country have provisions of law uh, requiring some contracts to be made in writing or to be evidenced by written evidence, okay, or to be signed. Right. Even in this country, if you look at Thailand, okay. In our country, we also have, you know, some formal requirements. According to Section 4.6 of the Civil and Commercial Code, okay, we have the formal requirement. At least a contract, a contract of sale of movable property in the Thai law, you know, the, according to Section 4.6, Paragraph 3, in conjunction with Paragraph 2, okay, a contract of sale of mobile property, okay, which involves the value of twenty thousand baht upwards, need to be in need to have what need to have written evidence, okay, and signed by the party liable. Unless you know the deposit is given, or unless then there is part performance. If there is no deposit, if there is no part performance. A contract is required, a contract of sale of mobile, mobile property which involves the price of at least 20,000 baht need to have some written evidence and signature of the party label. If A wants to sue B, then A needs to make sure that the contract has written evidence and the contract bears B signature. Right. So this is a formal requirement in Thai law and I'm sure that we can see similar formal requirements in the laws of many countries. The, I mean, the, simply because the laws of some countries still have some formal requirements, CISG therefore allows, okay, to allow CISG members to, to establish reservation, okay, to make reservation they can just make res reservation as to the formal requirements under their own law. Let's suppose that you know that in the in 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 the in the Estonia, Latvia, or Hungary. I mean, normally in many countries in in Eastern Europe, the, their law still you know that still have you know some formal requirements. Okay, they if let's say that Hungary, Hungary, thank you. Hungarian law sets set some formal requirements. So Hungary 
when they join the CHE, they may just, you know, they declare the reservation. They may say that, well, you know, the, if we apply CHE in this country, in Hungary, okay, uh, <coughs> we insist that a contract of sale need to have, you know, the need to have written evidence or need to be in writing something of that something of that sort. Okay. CIHE allows, you know, CIHE members to just make to just mean the you know the make the declaration in order to set the reservation as to the formal requirements. Okay. If we look at article article twelve of the CIHE, article twelve allows CHE members to uh, to make reservation as to form requirements under their own law. Okay, according to uh, Article 12, any provision of uh, Article 11, I hope that you remember Article 11, okay, Article, Article 11, it is an article which uh, speaks of the freedom from form principle. So the freedom from form principle in uh, Article 11 does not apply where any party has his place of business in a conferred state which has made a declaration under Article 96 of this convention. Article 96 is, a, is an article which allows you know the declaration okay to set the reservation. So let me that according to Article 12, if let's say that if Hungary, if Hungary that has the law saying that a contract of sale, some contracts of sale need to be uh, evidenced by writing, they can just make reservation, they can just make a reservation to the fact that a contract of sale, okay, this contract of sale in Hungary, if the case, okay, if the case is decided, okay, in the Hungary, then the Hungarian court will have to just, do what? Will have to just insist upon the Form requirement, the current court will have to insist that a contract of sale need to be in writing or uh, you know evidence by writing something like that, right? So the, the if you look at I mean the article two again, okay, sorry article the article the yes two again, article two allows CISG members to okay to just make the declaration in order to. Okay, make the reservation as to the form requirement. If any particular country make reservation, then a contract, okay, a contract need to be okay needs to be subject to the form requirement. But there are I mean, con conflicting views. Okay, the conflicting views as to how should how we should interpret Article Eleven. Oh, sorry, Article Twelve. Wheel 1 and wheel 2. According to wheel 1, wheel 1 seems to just go, you know, to the wording of the article 12. Okay, the wording of article 12 is that the form requirement, okay, in the domestic law applies where any party has his place of business in a conference state which has made a declaration under Article 96. So, for instance, if we have this case, let's go that we have this case, okay, which you now see on the screen. We have, let's say that A and B, okay, A and B. A, A from Japan, uh, B from Hungary. Let's say that the a and A and B, they make a contract. A Japanese trader and a Hungarian, you know, trader, they have made a contract. Let's suppose that the contract was made only in Tokyo. Okay. So when the contract was made in Tokyo, that means that Japanese law will be applicable law. Remember. Uh, you know, the contract needs to be governed by the law of the place where a contract is made. So given that the contract was made in Japan, so Japanese law applies to this contract, unless the party agrees otherwise, alright? But in this case, 
Japan, of course, Japan is a CIAT state, and Hungary is also a CIAT state. Of course, this contract you know, falls within the application of the CAG. You remember Article 2.1a, right? A con CAG applies where you know the parties have places of business in different states, which are contracting states. Okay, in this case, the parties A and B, they have places of business in different states, one in Japan, the other one in Hungary, and both Japan and Hungary, they are CISC states. So that, you know, the contract falls within the application of the CISC. But the thing is that we have a question here. The question as to whether or not this contract was enforceable. Was it enforceable? What is it enforceable or not? Okay. Rule number one is this. Rule number one, to, according to rule, rule, rule number one, this contract was not enforceable. It was unenforceable. Why? Because they go to the wording of Article 12. You know, the, the freedom from form. Okay. The, does not apply. Okay, where what? Sorry, the freedom from, yes, the freedom from form does not apply. All the formal requirements under the domestic law will apply where any party has his place of business in a contracting state which has made a declaration under Article 96. In this case, one of the party, see, any party, see, in this case, B one of the party has his place of business in Hungary, which is of course a contract state, which has made a declaration under Article 96. So in this case, Hungary has made a declaration as to the formal requirement. So, okay, this fact just trigger, you know, trigger, you know, the, the application of the domestic law as to the formal requirements right where any party if you are back to you know what is said in article 12 where any party has his place of business in a contract state which has made a declaration under article 96 so any party in this case b okay B has a place of business in Hungary, which is a contract state, and that contract state has made a declaration under Article 96. You know, Hungary has made reservation to the fact that you know the the form requirement under Hungarian law will still apply to the contract. See, so in this case, when the Hungarian when the Hungarian law requires this contract, you know, to be subject to some form requirement. Right. The freedom from form in the CISG will not apply. We have to just, you know, the we have to just mean the, insist that this contract be subject to the formal requirement according to Hungarian Hungarian law. See, so this is a rule number one. But according to the you know contracting will the way number two it is felt that it is so weird you know to you know interpret the law that way because in this case you can see that Hungary they have made the, the you know declaration of reservation but Japan has not made you know any declaration of reservation Japan does not does not you know the set any reservation so that Japan is happy, happy with the freedom from form. Okay, so the, in this case, you can see that this contract was governed by which country law? Okay, Jap Japanese law, because the contract was made in Tokyo, so that Japanese law is the applicable law. If we insist that this contract need to be in writing or this contract needs to be evidenced by writing according to 
Hungarian law, that is going to be very weird because the contract is governed by Japanese law and Japan does not make any reservation, okay? So, according to, according to the window number two, they interpret article, article uh, 12 this way, the freedom from form, okay, will not apply, okay? Okay, the freedom from form will not apply. All the form requirements apply when what? Where any party has his place of business in a contract state which has made a declaration under Article 96 and and what? And the applicable law as determined by the PAL rules is the law of the state that has made the reservation. Okay. In this case, back to this case, okay. even though Hungary has made you know the reservation as to the you know the form requirements, but if you look at this one, the applicable law as determined by the PIL, okay, it is it is which law? It is the law of Japan, okay. So when Japan has not made reservation, so it does mean that you know the articles. 12 here, okay, the freedom from form, the freedom from form still apply, okay? The form requirement according to Hungarian law does not apply, so the freedom from form, okay, will apply, and the, the form requirements, sorry, I, I made a mistake, okay? The form requirement applies where any party has his place of business in a contracted state which has made a declaration under Article 96, under Article 96 and the applicable law as determined by the PAL is the law of the state that has made the reservation. In this case, you know, the, the PAL leads to the law of Japan which has made no reservation. So that in this case, we can still, okay, that we can still resort to the freedom from form principle. Okay, we will not listen to the reservation, okay, made by Hungary because, you know, the applicable law as determined by the PIL, it is not Hungarian law, but it is the law of Japan that has made no reservation as to the freedom uh, as to the freedom from form, okay, notion. Right. Okay. So now back to, you know, the formation of a contract under the CIHG. We have seen that a contract is formed by the meeting of the minds in the sense that an offer and acceptance meets and an acceptance must match an offer completely, okay. So the, the, thing, the thing is, Okay, the, we have a question here. At what time, at what point of time will an offer or an acceptance, okay, uh, become effective? At what point of time will an offer or a, an acceptance become effective? You should be, you know, you should be the mindful here that, okay, they should, you should be mindful that, right, in many countries, they have what? They have many the they have many wait, wait, wait. Uh, is there something wrong with my slide here? Uh, effectiveness. You should have you know the one more slide here, okay the Oh yes, yes, yes. oh sorry, I mean the, we will talk about it later, okay. We will talk about uh, about the time at which an offer and acceptance becomes effective later, okay. So I just made a mistake. I think that you know, the, just now I thought that you know that we the Minda came to this this point, but now you know uh, we have not come to this point yet. Okay, now look at the nature of the, the meeting of the minds. Remember, a contract is formed by the meeting of the minds in the sense that an offer and an acceptance must meet. Okay, the meeting of the minds is reflected in Article 23 of the CIHG. According to Article 23, 
A contract is concluded at the moment when an acceptance of an offer becomes effective. In accordance with the provisions of this convention, okay, so that there must be the meeting between what? Between an offer and an acceptance. Right. So now we will look at the nature of an offer. Remember there are two things. An offer and the first thing is an offer and the second one is the acceptance. Okay, now we will look at the nature of an offer. Okay. In order for something to be an offer, okay, there must be two elements. The crucial, the, the you know essential elements of an offer are first sufficient definiteness and secondly the intention okay of your parole to be bound in case of an acceptance okay these two crucial elements are embodied in the article 14 paragraph 1 14 1 says that a proposal for concluding a contract addressed to one or more specific persons constitutes an offer if it is sufficiently definite and indicates the intention of the overall to be bound in case of acceptance. See, so you can see from the first sentence of this article, uh, you can see the you know the two elements, two essential elements of an offer. The first one is sufficient definiteness. The second one is the intention of the overall to be bound in case of acceptance. Okay, see. Element number one and element number two, okay. So the second sentence of the same, you know, the section, the, the second sentence of the same article, article 14, uh, paragraph one goes on to, you know, goes on to uh, say this, a proposal is sufficiently definite, that means that the second sentence from six to and elaborate upon you know the element of sufficient definiteness it says that a proposal is sufficiently definite if it indicates the goods and explicitly or implicitly okay implicitly fixes or makes provision for determining the quality and the price we can see that with respect to the first element in the first element is this one the sufficient defi definiteness okay so the first element is definiteness in order to constitute in order to constitute definiteness there must be two uh, you know two components uh, 1.1 and 1.2 here okay 1.1 it is the indication of the goods and 1.2 the second element it is what it is the, uh, you know, it is the quantity and the price, okay? Okay. The, the, the quantity and the price need to be fixed. Or, okay, the party make provision for determining the quantity and the price, whether expressly, okay, or by way of implication, okay, expressly or implicitly. Right. Now, we are coming to you know that we are coming to the element 1.1 remember 1.1 we are now talking about the element with respect to sufficient definiteness according to article 14 paragraph 1 okay sufficient definiteness is constitute constitute when first okay it indicates First, when the, you know that when there is the indication of the goods and okay, and of course, I mean that there is the indication of the quantity and the price, whether expressly or implicitly, right? With respect to the goods, right? With respect to the goods, right? That seem to be clear. You need to just say that you want to buy what? Okay, you want to buy what kind of goods? Right. But with respect to the quantity, okay. 
with respect to the quality, you don't need to give an exact quantity, like, well, I mean, the 500 tons of iron or what. You can just give, you know, the, just, uh, the statement, a statement in a way understandable to the, the parties, okay. You can just say that, well, the quantity is what? You can just make a reference to, like, 700 to 800 tons, okay. So, draft quality like this, is on, it is also okay. Right. A contract can be formed. We can have, you know, sufficient definiteness, even though the quality is fixed in range like this. Okay. 700 to 800 tons. Fine. Or you can just give the statement like this. Okay. Up to 250,000 pounds. Of soy, lexitin, fine. Even you know the statement like this: uh, we shall buy twenty truck loads, you know, twenty truck loads of tinned tomato concentrate. This seems to be fine as well. The quality seems to be fine if you just you know the express the quality like this. So the expression of the quantity in the you know the in the form of in the form like this, the 20 truck loads of tin tomato concentrate. This is enough to trigger, you know, the definiteness according to the CISG. Right. Now, you know, the heart of the price. If we come back to, you know, the, if we come back to, you know, the, the element uh, uh, 1.2. Okay, we have to indicate the quantity and the price. How to just make a mention of the price in order for a contract to be formed? In order to, in order, you know, to have an offer for the purpose of the formation contract, how can we just mention the price? Of course, okay, in the most cases, the price is an exact price. Let's say that, well, the, we, uh, we sell, you know, the iron at the price of uh, let's say that means uh, 10,000 pounds a ton, something like this, okay? But sometimes, sometimes, even though the parties do not express, you know, the the price in in an exact uh, amount, okay, the, we can just set the price in a range. Let's say that means uh, we can just mean set the price using the expression between, uh, between 30, 35 and 65 German marks. Well, this, this is a case before, you know, before the use of, uh, you know, the, the use of European currency, okay? Uh, the price was, the price was uh, mentioned uh, using the expression between 35 and 65 German marks. This seemed to be fine as well. This, you know, this, meet the requirement of sufficient definiteness according to Article 14 of the CISG. Okay, so the price in range, in a range like this, is enough. Right. Also, sometimes the parties may just mention the price. The party may quote the price okay, in the form of a provisional price and they will agree, they will agree you know, the exact price later, okay, they can just, you know, they make, they can just make a mention of, they can, they can just agree upon the provisional price, okay. The reason why the parties may agree, okay, the, on a provisional, provisional price first, before they shall work out, you know, an exact, an exact price later is because sometimes the sale is for the purpose of resale, you know, at the time when A and B make a contract of sale, maybe at a time, you know, the B wants to resell the goods which B will receive from A, okay? B will resell the goods to C. So this, the contract between A and B is made for the first purpose of resale to C. Right. Of course, when B resell the goods to C, B B intends to have some profits. 
So B, we have to find customer first. Okay. So the contract of sale between A and B may just set. Set what? Just a provisional price when B can find that when B can find customers, then A and B will meet. Okay, in order to fix okay a new price, which is relative to you know the, maybe to the amount of profit, okay, which is going to be obtained by B from the reserve when B can buy customers. See, so a provisional price like this, okay, seem to you know seem to serve the purpose of Article Fourteen of the CISES role, okay, and offer. We can have an offer between A and B, even though a contract between A and B just sets a provisional price, and the contract say that you know the the parties will work will the work out a, a new price, I mean an exact price later. This seems to be fine as well. Right now, let's suppose that everything is agreed. If you know that if A and B when they make arrangements, okay. They just they have not they have not agreed on the price. Can we say that there is a contract? Okay. In the CIHG, the CIHG has Article Fifty Five, which is considered as a gap filler. In the sense that if everything has been agreed upon, but the contract. Does not say any, anything about the price about a price. CAG will just save the life of this contract by preserving this contract. Okay, CAG will just take the view that there is a contract, but the price which is missing, okay, can be just can be just what can be just worked out by reference to the price. Generally charged at the time of the conclusion of the contract for such goods sold under comparable circumstances in the trade concerned. Everything has been agreed upon, but no price has been filed in the contract. In that case, A and B, the parties, they are taken by the CAG to have impliedly. Okay, agreed to resort to the price generally agreed. Sorry, generally charged at the time of the conclusion of the contract for such goods sold under comparable circumstances in the trade concern. That means that we will have to look at the price normally charged for the same goods. Okay, in similar circumstances or in comparable circumstances. Uh, now, I mean the article fifty point. It is again the gap filler. Is there any room to apply article articles of fifty point here? Well, you know the it is also felt that well that seem to be you know the that seem the the presence of article fifty point seem to be you know the contradiction. Why so? Before going to the contradiction, okay, let me just tell you that. Well, the the provision similar to what we see in the Article Fifty Point in the CISG can also be seen elsewhere in the Union de Droit Principles of International Commercial Contract Two Thousand Sixteen. We can also see the provision on price determination. Okay, according to Article One Point One, sorry, Five Point One Point Seven. Where a contract does not fix or make provision for determining the price, the parties are considered, in the absence of any indication to the contrary, to have made reference to again the price generally charged at the time of the conclusion of the contract for such performance in comparable circumstances in the trade consent. If the such price is available to a reasonable price, so we can see that the wording in the you know, Article Five Point One Point Seven of the Union Drop Disposal of International Commercial Contracts Two Thousand Sixteen. Okay, the wording seems to be very very similar. 
to the wording which we have seen in Article 55 of the CIHG. Okay. If all other matters, you know, all other necessary matters are agreed upon, but the price is absent. Okay. Agreement on the price is absent, then rather than the, you know the concluding that there is no such there is no contract okay due to the fact that okay when the price is missing okay then the certainty is also missing rather than saying so a contract can be preserved we can just okay conclude that a, there is a contract but the missing price can be the, the missing price okay can be worked out by reference to the price which is generally charged at the time of the conclusion of the contract for such goods sold under comparable services in the trade concerned. Right. Now we are coming to the contradiction, okay? Before going to that, okay, let me just say one thing, okay? In this country, in Thailand, in Thailand, we also have something close to that, even though not completely the same, okay? In Section 487 of our Civil and Commercial Code, the price of the property sold may be fixed by the, co the contract or may be left to be fixed in a manner thereby agreed or may be determined by the course of dealing between the parties. When the price is not determined as a foreset, the buyer may the buyer must pay a reasonable price. We can see that, you know, according to Section 487 of the uh, Civil and Commercial Code of Thailand, okay, uh, the price can be fixed by contract. The price, the price can be left to be fixed in a man in an agreed manner. The price can be determined by the cost of dealing. And in the absence of all of this, then, then the buyer need to pay a reasonable price. So, second. Section four eight seven. It is in a way. It is in a sense a gap filler as well. Now coming to the contradiction. Okay, why do I say that? You know the presence of Article fifty five. It is a contradiction. The contradiction run this way. Okay, if we go back to you know the elements, the group, the you know the essential elements of an offer. Remember, the, the very first element is the sufficient de definiteness. And according to section, according to Article 14, Paragraph 1, uh, sufficient de definiteness is, okay, cons constitute when what? When the party indicate the goods and they expressly or implicitly fix they fix or make provision for determining the quality and the price. Okay? So the price it is one of the crucial elements in order for the element of sufficient definiteness to be constituted without a price, without an indication of any price, then the sufficient definiteness cannot be you know cannot be Constitute at all, right? So when there is no price, then there is no sufficient definiteness in the first place. When there is no sufficient definiteness, that means that there is no offer in the first place. And when there is no offer, how can we have a contract? See. So, if there is no price, then there is no sufficient definiteness. When there is no sufficient definiteness, there is no offer. When there is no offer, there is no contract in the first place. So how can we apply Section 55 then? So it has been felt, you know, in many traditions that the presence of Article 55, although it is claimed to be the gap filler, but it is a contradiction, okay? It is saying that if the price is missing from from the beginning, if the price is missing at the outset, then we cannot have sufficient definiteness for the purpose of an offer, for the purpose of having an offer in the first place, and when there is no offer, there is no contract. 
say. But this point, you know, the feeling, uh, this point, the feeling uh, regarding, you know, the, the contradiction. Some courts or some tribunals, they apply section 55, even though, you know, the section 55, by and large, have not been applied by many courts and many tribunals. But some courts and some tribunals have applied section 55 in one case, you know, in one case where, you know, the contract between the party, okay, they use the, the language in a way that the price would have to be fixed during the season. Okay, the, it was, it was uh, built by, I can't remember this, whether this is a court case or it is a, this is the, the, you know, the, the arbitration case. Right. It was built by, you know, the, by the, the, uh, by the courts. Let's support it. It's a court, okay? That the use of the expression to be fixed during the season, okay? It is, it is a what? It is, you know, the, it is the reference made to the price generally charged at the time of the conclusion of the contract for such use. So, under comparable services in the trade consent according to section 50, according to, not section, okay, I made a mistake, article, okay, according to article 55 of the CISG. Right. Okay, the, so that, you know, that we can see that, okay, some courts and some tribunals have indeed applied, okay, section 55 as a, as a gap filler in order, you know, for a contract to be formed. Rather than, rather than just saying that there, there was no contract simply because the price was missing. Right. Now, quality, remember, if we are back to, you know, the elements, crucial elements for, the crucial elements, you know, the, for the sufficient definiteness in order to, in order for something to be an offer, remember, there is also an element with respect to what? With respect to okay. there are there are elements with respect to the indication of the goods, the quantity and the price. Question. The question is whether or not C I S G okay in uh, Article fourteen requires the indication of the the uh, quality. If we look at six if we look at Article 14, there is no requirement as to, there is no mention of the indication of the quality, okay? The CAC Article 14 just requires indication of the goods, indication of the quantity, and the indication of the price, but not an indication of the quality, okay? So if we talk about the indication of quality, even though this is not required by Article 14 of the CISG, but it has been felt that if the quality is not specified, it is treated in the same way as not specifying the goods. That means that it may be felt that specifying only the goods without you know, mentioning the quality it is no different, no different from, no different from the, you know, the specifying nothing. Okay. If you specify, if you specify the goods without specifying the quality, okay, it is, it is treated like, like there is no indication of the goods. Right. So the two place F, you should specify the quality as well. Okay. If you specify the quality, of course, in most cases, the quality may be clearly specified, the exact quality may be specified, but that is not strictly required. We may just specify, we may just specify the quality in a manner which is understandable okay, to the parties. You can just, let's say, in the case of a sale of uh, chinchilla pills in one case when the party specified okay the goods 
Okay, the use in the language chinchilla pills. Chinchilla pills are middle or better quality. This is enough. This is an indication of the quality. Okay, because the party, the party, the other party could proceed the description. Okay, to, to be sufficiently definite. So you know the spec specification of quality can be done in the manner which is understandable to both parties. That is fine. Right. Now we have seen. You know we have seen the nature of you know, the nature of what the nature of of an offer. Now let me just tell you a, a na the nature of an acceptance. Okay. The acceptance must indicate assent to an offer. This is uh, this is this is uh, you know the this is said in Article 18 of the CISG. A statement made by or other the statement made by or other conduct of the offeree indicating assent to an offer is an acceptance. Silence or inactivity does not in itself amount to acceptance. Okay, so you know the what is what is important is that okay when A make an offer okay and then B if B wants to accept his offer B needs to accept okay B need to accept the offer B need to have an acceptance. An acceptance must indicate assent to an offer. Right. The thing is that when, when the CHG say that it is an assent to, it is the assent to an offer, that means that, okay, the acceptance must meet the offer. Remember, when acceptance meets the offer, that is the meeting of the minds in order for a contract to be concluded or to be full, okay? We have an offer and we have an acceptance for the purpose of the formation of contract. Now, okay, at what point of time will an offer or an acceptance become effective? You can see that you know that in many countries they have you know that they have adopted different rules with respect to you know the time of effect effectiveness of. The declaration of an in intention. Okay, some countries may use. Okay, some country may resort to the expression rule. A declaration of intention will become effective as soon as it is expressed. Some country, you know, adopt the dispatch rule. According to the dispatch, the dispatch rule, dispatch rule. Okay, an intention, a declaration of intention will become effective once it is dispatched. Or sent to the other party. Some countries, okay, have adopted the receipt rule. A declaration of an of an intention will take effect as soon as it reaches the other party. Reaches mean what? Reaches mean when it reaches the other party. That's mean that when it is received by the other party. That's mean that okay, the rule is the receipt rule. But sometimes we can see that okay, some countries. Adopt the perception rule or the knowledge knowledge rule. A declaration of an intention will take effect once it is known to the other party. Okay, the knowledge the knowledge rule or the per perception rule. Okay, now when different countries may have adopted you know different rules with respect to the term of effectiveness of the declaration of an intention. It must be, you know, the matter, you know, to be decided by the CAG drafters, which rule should be adopted for the purpose of the formation of the contract. Okay, so CIHG, CIHG drafters, okay, have adopted the receipt rule. If you look at Article 15.1 and Article 18.2, you can see that according to 15.1, an offer becomes effective when it reaches the offeree. Similarly, under Article 18.2, an acceptance of an offer becomes effective at the moment the indication of an of assent reaches the offeror. See, 
share the weather edition of uh, or reception, it is effective when it reaches the other party. An offer is effective when it reaches the offeree. An acceptance becomes effective when it reaches the offeror. See. So the, if you you know the if you compare with Thai law, okay, Thai law uh, distinguishes you know the modes of communication into two modes: non-intentional mode of communication and intentional mode of communication. Okay. If a party declares an intention, okay, in a non instantaneous mode, then that declaration of intention will become effective when it reaches the other party or when it is received by the other party. But in the case of a declaration of intention made in a made in an instantaneous mode, it will be effective when it becomes known to the other party. It said that the CAG just resort to just one, you know, one rule. Okay, the receipt rule. An offer will be effective when it is received by the offeree. An acceptance will be effective when it is when it is received by the offeror. Okay, so the for the sake of completion, okay, let me just also you know tell you uh, English law on this point. In English law, we just you know the look at English law just for the purpose of, of comparison. In English law, the default rule is the receipt rule. Okay, the, but in English law, you know the they have the rule, the, they have the rule, the, they have the rule, the for 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 the, the communication of an acceptance. In order for a contract to be formed, of course, there must be the meeting of the minds. A makes an offer and B accepts A's offer. The acceptance by B need to be communicated to the other party. B need to communicate B's acceptance to A. And uh, you know, English law, uh, you know, the comes up with comes up with the rule that. An acceptance is communicated when it is received by the other party. So this is the default rule. Okay. The acceptance and acceptance will be effective when it is received by the other party. There is one exception. Okay. If an acceptance is posted by post, if the acceptance is communicated by post. Then the, that acceptance will be effective once it is posted. So once you just post your letter, let's say that you know that let's suppose that you know the A make an offer to B, and B when B receives a offer, once B you know drops the drops the acceptance okay in the at the post office or you know in the post box like this. Once B just post uh, his acceptance, the acceptance is duly communicated and a contract is formed because the acceptance is duly communicated to the offeror. So, in the case of making an acceptance by post, English law sets the rule that okay, the acceptance will be regarded. As having been communicated once it is posted. So let's suppose that after B post this acceptance, the acceptance is lost. The acceptance never reached A at all. Will there be a contract between A and B? The answer is yes. Even though you know B letter is lost in the Romeo service, B letter has never reached A at all. In this case. The acceptance made by B has duly been communicated to A, so that a contract is formed between A and B. You may feel that well, it's very strange. You know that the contract can be formed in this case when B makes acceptance, when B makes an acceptance, but acceptance, you know, is lost in you know in the course of transmission by post like this. The ra the rationale behind the law is this. Okay. Both parties A and B, when they resort to you know 
when there is sought to communication by post, they impliedly appoint the post office as their agent. They nominate, you know, the post office as their agent. So when B post a lecture, okay, let's say that when B makes an acceptance and post the acceptance, you know, in the post box like this, the lecture is in the hands of whom? In the hands of the post office, which is A's agent. So we can just say that the lecture sent by B is in A's hand through the agent. Okay, through the agent. Okay, because, you know, the, the post office is also A's agent. Okay, so that in this case, even though the letter is lost, it doesn't matter. A contract is formed between A and B, nonetheless, because the acceptance has duly been communicated to B once it is posted. Again, okay, the English law resorts to, you know, the, the, the receipt rule by default, except in the case of making the acceptance by purse, in which case, okay, English law adheres to the postal rule. Uh, now you know when there are so many so many modern com communications devices. Okay, let's say that telex, of course, telex I means the telex seems to be the technology in the old day. We have also you know the uh, fax machines like this. We have now we can have emails. Okay, we can also send messages via let's say live, and there are also some other devices in the future. When, you know, this kind of modern devices come up to the world, the question is, which rule apply? Should English law adhere to the receipt rule, the default rule, or the postal rule? Okay, the, well, there is no direct case on this point, but there is the direct case on telex in the old day. And, uh, you know, something like 1960-something. At that time, you know, the... This device, the telex, text machine was invented. And people seem to use this device in those days. Right. So the, the courts in those days would have to consider whether or not. Just one moment, please. I'm going to check on the screen to make sure that the video seems to be okay. Okay, fine. Okay, video seems to be okay. The way it runs. It, uh, you know, it, it, it has come to, you know, the, uh, according to the time, okay, one hour and 22 minutes, uh, 38 seconds, okay, very, very fine, okay, very, 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 very fine, okay. Now, back to the telex case. We have telex cases in 1960-something, okay, when the telex machine came to the world, the courts would have to take the opportunity of choosing between the receipt rule, the default rule, and the postal rule. The very the the one of you know uh, earlier, one of early cases in this case. Okay, the interest and uh, my far is here. Okay, this case was concerned with the use of telex in both both mean the Lord Justice Parker and uh, Lord Justice Denning at the time. Okay, took the same view. I interview that, okay, the rule which applied to TEDx it is the receipt rule. The TEDx message which was transmitted, okay, would be regarded as becoming effective when it is received by the other party. Okay, so when, okay, A makes an offer to B by TEDx and when B send the acceptance by TEDx back to A, Okay. The acceptance made by B would be duly communicated as soon as it is received by A. Okay. That is you know, the position okay, in this case. At that time, it was quite unclear as to the reason by the court. Why did the court take a view that you know, the, uh, the use of TEDx, okay, it, is, it is the case which triggered the receipt rule, not the postal rule, but the reasons seem to be quite clear, okay, in a later case known as the Brinkibun, the Brinkibun case, okay, 
and the Brinkman case, it was explained by the court that the reason why the receipt rule should apply is this. The court said, well, you know, when the parties A and B, when A and B, you know, they, when they use, you know, sort of the modern device like this, okay, when they use modern, modern device like this, of course, when, uh, in those days, in the, those days, the case were concerned with only tenants because in those days, I mean, that they were, they were not, you know, more modern devices like, you know, fax machine, okay, the, or I mean, the email or the uh, other things. Okay, but the courts, the, the courts seem to take the view that the reason why, okay, they, uh, they regarded that, you know, the receipt rule should apply is this. When the party make use of this kind of device, they are in the position to tell whether or not the message which they sent reaches, reaches the other party. Because if the message does not reach the other party, they are in the, the position to know, maybe you know, the fake machine, maybe you know, the telex machine would have you know, something, would have, would have you know, some message. Uh, maybe the machine would produce some message te telling the sender that, well, the message which you sent is not successful, something like that, okay? So when the party is in a position to know whether or not the message which is being sent reach the other party or not, that party, the sender, should make sure that the message actually reaches the other party. Okay, so this is the reason which is reflected in the Brinkman case, okay? Now, well, there are so many other details, but I don't think that Tom permit me to address this one, okay? So I try to just I mean, skip, skip I mean, the, some other matches, okay? Now, the, before I end I mean, the, the, the lecture on this part, okay, in this part, okay? Let me just take you to comparison between Thai law and English law with respect to the term, the term at which, okay, the communication uh, becomes effective. In Thai law, as I have brought to your attention, okay, we have the distinction between a non instantaneous mode of publication and an instantaneous mode of communication. With respect to a non instantaneous mode of communication, the communication will become effective when it, it reaches the other party. This is the receipt rule. But with respect to an instantaneous mode of communication, okay, if you may, if you, you know, the, if you the, uh, declare your intention in an intense mode of communication, like by telephone or, you know, the, the device of, uh, of a similar nature, then it will become effective when it is known to the other party. That is according to section, uh, you know, 168 and 169. Okay, 168 and 169. Do I have 168 and 169? Uh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, I should have you know the wording of the section section one six eight and section one six nine, okay? But I'm not quite sure. Okay? If you are interested in in one six eight and one six nine, you can have a look at you know the, the wording in one six eight and one six nine. According to one six one six eight, one six eight deals with the the creation of intention, okay? In an is in an in sentence mode. The decoration, the decoration of, of an intention will become effective when it becomes known to the other party. And according to 169, 169 deal with the uh, communication, okay, in a non instantaneous mode of communication, a decoration of intention, okay, in a non instantaneous mode will be effective when it is, when it reaches the other party. When it reaches the other party, that means that when it is received by the other party, okay? But in English law, the default rule is the, the recent rule, except that in the case of making an acceptance by cursed, then English law will adhere to the postal rule. The acceptance, the acceptance will be regarded as duly communicated once it is posted okay right okay i think that we should have a break
now, and after the break, then we will look at you know the ending effects, uh, ending effects of an offer, okay? And we will also talk about uh, the uh, situation which is known as the battle of forms. That is something very important, okay? So now let us break for about ten minutes, okay? And then we will just resume the class later. See you soon.